Hello, everyone. Um, I can't really see you from up here. Um, welcome to my talk. My name is Dave Gunnell. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about something very exciting, because programming is pretty exciting, right? Yeah, but metaprogramming is exciting exciting. But first, I have a small aside. Oh, this is where this happens again. My, um, last time I did this, my clicker failed, so I might have to go behind the thing. A brief announcement. Does anyone know what I'm going to talk about there, here? OK, so my company, underscore, uh, we're a consultancy, and we're also a training company. We write a lot of books. Um, you can tell which one we hired a designer to design the cover of. Um, oh, cheers. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it back up. Anyway, look, this is just a very quick announcement to say, as of about yesterday, uh, all of our books are no longer cost money. So you can go to our website and get any one of our books for free. There's the website. And we wrote some blog posts about why we did it. Um, so there you go. There's the publicity stunt. And now let's get on with the talk. So is this one going to work? This one's not working either, unless I need to turn a switch on. Yes, I do. There we go. Brilliant. OK, back to the scheduled program. So we're talking about metaprogramming. What is, what is metaprogramming? Well, uh, we can think of it as this idea of writing programs that write programs. But as Scala developers, we can also think about it as teaching the compiler to write code for us, giving it rules to write code for us. And this is really good. Um, this is um, uh, something we can use for a lot of purposes. At least two of those purposes are, are the ones I'm going to talk about today, are making nice DSLs uh, for our libraries and for getting rid of boilerplate um, from our code. But the reason I'm giving a talk about metaprogramming is that um, it can also be quite difficult to get right. So there's various different approaches to metaprogramming in Scala. Um, they're suitable for different tasks. And um, if we choose the wrong approach to the wrong task, we can spend more time getting things to work than we otherwise would. So we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about macros and shapeless. And uh, we're going to cover topics like uh, which of these should we choose for any given problem? How can we make that approach work well with our code? So how can we integrate it neatly into our code? Um, how should we get started? Uh, what sort of, what are, how should we design our code? Um, and we're going to see all of this through the medium of a couple of examples. I apologize. I'm being slightly sketchy because the slide in front of me is actually showing me what's on the screen and not the preview of my next slide. So I'm slightly phased by that. I'll see if I can ignore it. Um, I'm going to be quite high level in this talk. I'm, not going to, I'm going to show you code, but I'm not going to walk through it as I would normally do with a talk. Uh, all of the code is here on this GitHub. So if you have a laptop and you want to look through it now, you can do that, or you can look at it afterwards. And I'll point you to many learning resources at the end of the session. So I've got two case classes. Uh, case classes? Use cases? Examples. Case studies. There, there we go. Case studies for you. Um, and uh, we're going to look at both case studies from the point of view of macros and the point of view of shapeless. And the first case study is the simplest I could think of uh, to give us a warm up, which is just building values, constructing values given types. So here is our case study. We have a simple case class, something very regular that we might write in our code. And we want to be able to create values of it, but we are lazy. Uh, I'm lazy. I hope you're all lazy too. We want to build uh, the case class without actually, um, OK, the pointer's not working, without actually specifying all the, the parameters to the constructor. And it, you know, we can do this by making default values on the arguments. That's all fine. But uh, we weren't going to do it with some fancy programming techniques to justify our uh, Scala salaries. Um, so we're going to write some macros or shapeless code to do it. So we're going to write create and give it a type. And it's going to build a, a value of that type. So let's start off by looking, about how, looking at how we might do this with a macro uh, caveat. Uh, I'm talking about Scala reflect macros. I'm not cool enough to know about Scala meta yet. So uh, uh, we're going to be looking at the old version. All the macros are fairly short. That's actually one of the kind of points um, and, uh, of this talk. And I assume are easy to port. But uh, if there's any of the Scala meta people around, they can comment on that towards the end. So we're going to write code like this. And what a macro does is it rewrites our code for us. It expands it into something uh, more useful. Um, and uh, the way we do that is by defining our create function uh, as a macro like this. So 
we, we call create, it has a type parameter A, and we're returning a value of type A. But the implementation, in terms of the macro, uh, is a piece of code that runs inside the compiler. So rather than thinking about types, we're going to think about the uh, metadata that the compiler is holding about those types. So in this case, you see we have this thing called a weak type tag, which is part of the macro API, and it's basically a, an interface to say, what is this type A? What's its name? What methods has it got? All of these kind of questions. And then rather than returning a value of type A, we're going to return a tree. And a tree is an abstract syntax tree. So we're actually building a piece of code to construct an A. So broadly speaking, we do, we, first of all, we try to find an apply method in our implementation. We try to find an apply method for our type. And then we have to look at all the parameters to that apply method and find out what values to insert, what expressions to insert at each position. And then this Q thing at the end, this quasi quote, is constructing a piece of Scala code. And that's what we return. OK? Great. Dead silence. I assume we're all OK. Are we OK? Yeah, yeah that's better. Right, cool. OK, so. These are the steps we're going to go through. Like I said, I'm not going to show you the code. I'm going to show you how it works. So we start with our macro, uh, our, uh, the, the code the user writes, and then we look up our type. That's a thing inside uh, the, the, the macro API. From that, we look up a thing called a symbol. And a symbol represents a definition. So in this case, it'll be like class ice cream. And that will give us all sorts of information, what the constructors look like, what the fields look like, and what the companion object looks like. So we go to the symbol for the companion object. And then when we've done that, we look at all the methods for the companion object. We pick a method called apply. This is literally the level of sophistication that we're operating on. We look for the string apply in the method name. Um, and from there, we figure out all the parameter types. And then when we've done that, we generate expressions for each parameter type, and we are done. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> this is the code that does it. Um, it's about 40 lines for people who are judging by weight. Um, so 40 lines worth of value delivered. Um, and that part at the top there is the bit that I just showed you with the three lines, but expanded out. We have a helper method to look for an apply, uh, apply method. So you can see there we're saying, find a member that's a method and is public and has the right return type and all of that. And then we have a thing at the end. This helper method here is helping us fill in the parameter types. So what that's doing, this is the only bit of code I want to focus on is it is taking a type of one of those parameters and saying, what expression should I fill in? And this is the simplest possible implementation I could think of. If it's a string, I'll get, return an empty string, the expression representing an empty string. If it's an int, I'll return zero. And if it's a boolean, I'll return false. And if it's anything else, well, you know, we, we only designed this to work with three types. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to raise a compilation error. OK. That gives us working code. We can take an ice cream, which has a string, an int, and a boolean in it, and we can build our constructor call. However, there's a bunch of problems with it. Can anyone think of a problem with this piece of code? Shout out. Don't be shy. Say again. It is not extensible to new types. It only knows about three types. And we can extend it, right? We can extend to double and long and all these other types, but we can never extend it to all the types the user knows about. So um, it's, it's not extendable. And that's like a fatal flaw, right? Anyone who wants to construct values is going to want to construct values that contain things of their own types. So um, what we need to do here is we need to actually think twice. Our initial implementation is naive. Let's go back and look at how we can do this macro again and make it extendable. So, right, think about it. User's going to type create A. We're going to have to look up that type A. We're going to have to go through all the parameter types. And whatever type of parameters we have, we need to somehow look up some code based on the type that we can use to generate the, the, uh, the expression we need, right? Now, what programming pattern does that sound like? That sounds like a type class with an appropriate woo. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to use a type class to support our macro. So this is an interesting thing right here. I'm talking about metaprogramming. I'm talking about uh, fancy things. A type class is a relatively unfancy thing. Well, it's pretty cool, actually. It's actually very cool. But it's not, strictly speaking, 
uh, 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 the sort of stuff we're talking about here, and yet it's essential. So I'm going to build this type class. I've called it pure, which is just the same name as this method we get in cats to do it. So it's just a type class that takes a type parameter A and has a method to return an A. And then I can start building instances of the type class. Those are my three test instances, the three types I care about. And I can summon an inst any one of those instances, string int or boolean, using uh, this helper method called implicitly. So anywhere in my code, I can say, get me a pure of string, implicitly pure of string, and the compiler will go and look for anything tagged implicit that's in scope, and it will return it to me. So we can use that with our macro with our helper method, the one that summons the values for the parameters, and we can just re-implement it like this. So we're still looking for the parameter type, we're returning an expression, but the expression that we are returning is making use of the type class. And I've got these weird, like, root.scala.predef things in here. Macros in Scala Reflect are unhygienic, and so any variable name you use, the user could come along and hijack it and turn it into something else, probably by accident, hopefully not maliciously. So I'm globally um, uh, 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 referencing all the types here. Basically, this is this piece of code. Right? So I can say, OK, find me a, a pure for my parameter, whatever my type of parameter I have, and call its value method. And that will give me an expression that gives me a value of that type. So now, when I write create ice cream, I get something that looks like this. Not the sort of code we want to write by hand, but who cares, right? It's a macro. It's writing the code for us. Uh, and from there, we, we have a working solution. So it's now user customizable. It can handle any parameter type we throw at it or the user throws at it, because if they want to have a parameter of type Java util date, for example, they just go and implement an instance of pure, tag it as implicit, and we're good. But this approach is brittle. It's brittle in numerous ways. Uh, I, I don't know if, you sort of, you, if you've written any macros before. You're probably looking at this flowchart that I built and thinking, well, there's a whole bunch of steps in here that can break. What if um, I call pure and I don't provide a class, a, ty a, a type that is a class? I could provide you know, a, a, an abstract type or, or something, something weird. One of these scholars has got many different types of type. It could be something that's not a class, and maybe we can't look up this symbol. What if the symbol doesn't have a companion object? What if the companion object doesn't have an apply method? What if it's got two apply methods? There's all of these weird sort of uh, 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 things that we have to take into account in our own code. They, they're all solvable, and a valid solution is to just go, well, look, it'll only work for case classes. You've got to have one apply method, blah, 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 right? So has anyone used play here? Uh, that macro with the uh, JSON macro, the JSON.format macro, uh, who's had the error where you've got two apply methods on your class and it won't work anymore? Right, so the macro just doesn't cope with this. It could cope with this. It could use a heuristic to choose which one, but that is sort of applying bias, you know, the, the, the designer's bias to it. So it quite rightfully, I think, fails. Okay, so what, and, and, and as macro writers, these are all tedious things that our users will throw back at us because it doesn't work in a particular situation. So we'll look at the shapeless implementation of this now. And the, the point here is just to show that in this implementation, we are looking at things in a, 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 like a, um, a higher level of abstraction. So we don't have to think about as many things. So the way the shapeless stuff will work, we're still going to use our pure type class, but we're going to repurpose it to actually solve the whole problem here. So we are going to implement a new instance of pure for any data type. So any data type A, I can summon a value of type A. So rather than dealing with a single parameter to our constructor, it will just deal with the whole thing. And you might say, well, why didn't you do that with the macro? And the answer is I didn't think about it. But anyway, we got there now. And the way it does it, uh, this is, you know, I, I talk about, uh, in all the talks I've given about shapeless, I always talk about one aspect of shapeless, which is type class derivation, so specifically solving this problem. And, and, and I'm focusing my discussion to just this part of shapeless again. Um, but the way this is going to work is shapeless will give us a piece of magical machinery um, called a generic. And generic is a type class where we give it a data type, and it will map that onto another data type. So we say, uh, here's ice cream, can you give me the structure of ice cream? Or can you map this onto another data type which we can process generically? 
And Shapeless will say, yes, I can. I can give you this thing. It is an H list. Uh, but more importantly, it is showing us, it's a, it's a recursively defined type. It's showing us what the constituent parts of ice cream are, what sort of order they appear in, uh, and how many there are. And because this type has structure, we can analyze it. Uh, we can pull its pieces, and we can write instances of pure to cope with each part independently. So we write a, a pure for ice cream. The way our algorithm would work is we use the generic to turn that into this generic representation, string, cons, int, cons, boolean, cons, h nil. And then we say, OK, well, how am I going to generate a value of this? Well, I can generate a value of string. I've already written that rule. I've got a pure string. And then maybe I'll look at the tail of the H list. Well, how do I do that? I've used my value for int. I look at the tail of that. I use my value of Boolean. And I can easily generate a value of an empty H list. And all of these components together recursively call one another. And we can then get all the way back up to our ice cream. And the code looks something like this. This kind of code is, uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, I, I have actually copies of the, sh the Shapeless book here to, to, to give out at the end. Uh, if, you, if you find this code uh, difficult to parse. Uh, but basically, the idea is we have a rule. I wonder if I've done this. Yeah, we have a rule for empty H lists. We have a rule to say, given a rule for the tail of my H list and a rule for the head, how do I combine them together? And I say, have a rule that says, given a rule for an H list, how do I generate a rule for something that maps onto that H list? Thus, the problem is solved. So this will work for all case classes out of the box. It's subject to some constraints, right? So there are certain data types like regular classes with some vague constraints uh, that it won't work for. But the key thing is we haven't had to worry about finding apply methods or doing all this, this, this low-level stuff. Uh, we've written 16 lines of code, including crazy line wrapping. Um, probably more like six lines, seven lines of code if we were to actually write those method headers. But then I would need 16 by 10 slides rather than, or no, whatever, 16 by 5. Wide, wide screen. I can't do ratios. OK, so what have we done? We got, we got better code out of using Shapeless in this instance. And the reason we got better code is because, I'll back up, the reason we got better code is because the solution we're writing is operating on a high level of abstraction. It's saying, rather than saying, uh, uh, what class have we got? What methods has that got? Is there this method? Has it got parameters? And going through all of this, we're simply saying, what are the components that make up this class? Let's solve for those components. And Shapeless is, is doing the sort of the underlying processing. Okay, so so in this instance, I think Shapeless, Shapeless is a is a, a, a neater solution. There are a couple of uh, 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 um, things we can say negatively about. God, I'm losing words. It's bad when you're doing a talk and you can't think of words. There's, there's some negative things we could maybe say, criticisms that people might raise against this approach. What about error messages? What about compile times? I'll just go into them. Error messages. Well, really, when we're writing uh, shapeless code, we're dealing with implicits. In fact, actually, when we were writing the macro code, we were dealing with implicits. Uh, error messages for implicit are, I could not find the implicit. They don't give you any information about the problem whatsoever. So that's, uh, that's a, tricky, a tricky problem. And we have to solve by sort of working through all the steps that our shapeless solution would be doing and sort of trying an intermediate step and seeing if that gives an error message and so on. Apparently, there are better error messages about implicits in Dottie. So I have heard from Martin in a corridor between talks uh, at some point. Maybe someone can, can enlighten us on that at the end. Uh, the other thing is compile times. And compile times are not as big a problem as you might think until they are. Um, imagine what the H list for this looks like. It's pretty big data. Um, now imagine that the very last field is a type that we don't know how to, don't have an instance of pure for. So when we are solving this problem recursively, we're going to look at this H list. We're going to run all the way down to the end, fail on that last um, field. You can imagine there's a lot of intermediate processing. In fact, in general, if we can't find a solution, uh, the, the shapeless code will look at all these hundreds of possibilities and then say, I can't find a solution. So we can be subject to that problem. Uh, worse still, we can have recursive data structures where you know, if you think this has got 26 different fields in it, this thing has got three by three by three different possibilities uh, that it can expand into. So the solution with that is to um, use uh, intermediate implicit definitions. So there's a, we can say, in this instance, first of all, let's work out how to solve this problem for inner. 
then we say, I've got a solution. I use this thing called cached implicit, which uh, 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 allows us to say, all right, solve this. Uh, and then the solution to this is stored in inner pure. Then when I'm solving for middle, because I'm dealing with instances of inner, the search space is collapsed. So we can get much more efficient compile times out of that. Okay. Oh, and there's uh, also, we mustn't forget, the, uh, the, the, the stuff that Miles has been working on in the type level compiler, which is working its way into the Scala. I forget. There's some stuff is happening. It's going to get faster, lots faster, because uh, the optimizations basically can sense this use case, this pattern, and sort of reorder the order in which the compiler does things. Okay. So, this is, in my opinion, well, a structural solution is possibly the wrong way, way of saying this. We get a better uh, solution from Shapeless here because we're thinking at a higher level of abstraction. We have fewer uh, cases to worry about. 52. Okay, cool. Good. All right. But the other thing to note is that most of our solution is just, it's nothing to do with shapeless or, well, it's sort of, nothing to do with shapeless or macros, it's a type class. And by writing the type class, uh, to begin with, we inform both solutions. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this part. Okay, sweet. Right, I've got another case study. This one is uh, a slightly different type of thing. We're going to be jumping over to data validation. Does anyone have any questions about the first case study? No. Good. Right, we can, we can keep going. Another case study here. This is to do with validation. Um, I have a little library I'm working on. It's like a toy library called Checklist, which does exactly this. So if this interests you, go check out Checklist. Uh, and the idea here is that we're doing runtime validation. So we've got our ice cream again. The data type for ice cream gives us a whole bunch of uh, information about that. It tells us what types the fields are. But it doesn't tell us other useful things. Like, it doesn't tell us that the number of cherries on an ice cream must be zero or greater. Uh, and we can solve that with various clever uh, libraries like Refined, or we can do like a simple solution, which is just do some runtime validation. So what Checklist allows you to do is to uh, build a function, essentially, that you can pass an ice cream into, and it tells you what's wrong with it. So this is, this, this is a nice DSL, nice little syntax, and we're saying, you know, check this field with this rule, check the name field with this non-empty string rule, check the cherries field with this greater than equal and zero rule. It's pretty cool. What's even cooler is, when you get back error messages, it'll tell you where things went wrong. So again, this is inspired by the play JSON library, right? When, you, when JSON validation fails, it tells you where all the validation errors happen. And the key thing here is, the names of the fields that we report in our, uh, data, uh, in our uh, error messages at the end are based upon the names of the fields that we are analyzing. How can we achieve that? Metaprogramming. So let's look at this with macros. So the way we do it with a macro is we, we implement our field method as a macro, and then we look at what the person's written here, cherries, and we turn that into a string and also use it as an accessor method. So, um, and, and the, the key to understanding this, uh, I'll just walk you through how the library is designed to show you how this works. The key to understanding this is that every part of this rule is another rule. It's all, it's all rules all the way down. So this GTE0 is also a rule. So what we can do, uh, GTE0 on its own is a rule you can apply it to an integer. So you can say, you know, you can say, apply this rule to minus one, and it will say minus one must be greater than or equal to zero. It has, the rule has failed. What we can also do then is we can apply combinators to the rule to get it up to what we need it to be when we're dealing with an ice cream. So we can say, prefix this rule with this path. So you notice, when, actually, when the original rule gives you an error message, it says nil at the end there, the path is empty. That says the whole piece of data is wrong. You say, prefix this to cherries. It says, OK, well, it's not the whole. It, it's, it's, we're now reporting the same error message, but we're saying this field cherries is wrong. And then we can use this fancy name method, contramap, which is like mapping backwards, uh, to say, this rule is now not a rule that checks an int. It's a rule that checks something else, in this case, an ice cream. And what we're going to do when we run the rule is we're going to call this function cherries, pull out an int, and then run the original rule on it. OK, so now we can su supply a whole ice cream, and we check just that one field. And when we check the field, the result comes out with the right method name. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an expansion that looks like this. 
When we say our original, uh, our original uh, rule, we're instead saying, here are two possible rules. I want to and them together. And is a particularly unacademically uh, named combinator. Uh, so I want to take the name rule and the cherries rule and apply them both and collect all the error messages. So how do we do this? So, so I mean, the key thing here, I guess, is that each one of these field macros is expanding into one of the rules here. So we're going to write field as a macro. And you know, the, 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 the method itself takes in a, a function and another rule and returns a rule. And the macro looks like this. You see def field macro, third line down there, takes in a tree, takes in an expression that the user has supplied, and another expression, and returns an expression. And this is actually the complete implementation. All we do is we look at the function expression. We pat match on it. And you can see that we're basically saying, are you a function that returns a field on some value? See the, see the structure. We have a, an argument list and object.name on the right-hand side. If you are, then I want to extract the name part, which is an identifier. And I want to turn it into a string by calling toString. And I want to turn that into a string literal expression by sticking it in a quasi quote. And if it's anything else, fail. And then we expand into this thing at the end here. We say rule.prefixname.contramatfunc. We know that part. And then this c.prefix part is to just say, well, when we are expanding the field macro, we are in like a method call position. So I need you to bolt this method call, this and method, onto what we already had. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Uh, for those who are counting, that is also 16 lines of code. And I think that's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand, right? I mean, we talk about Scala Reflect going away and Scala Meta coming in. I feel quite happy putting this macro in my code right now and then rewriting it when Scala Reflect doesn't work anymore. That's short enough and light enough that it's not a maintenance problem. So um, we've now got this expansion. OK. Analysis. I like this. I think this is easy. I, I, hope, I hope you agree with me. This is a pretty straightforward macro. Um, and the reason it's short and the reason it's simple is, well, first of all, the problem we're solving is quite straightforward, but also it is a syntactic problem. We are just putting a very, very thin layer of DSL over a library we've already written. So by writing the library, by just doing functional programming, we have solved our problem. And all we're doing now is offering convenience to the user. Um, so that's, that's a real key point I want to provide. If you write your li library, library correctly first, or you think about clean functional design, then this stuff is easy to add on top. Let's look at the shapeless solution. You might be surprised to hear that you can solve this with shapeless. It doesn't feel like a, 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 a shapeless -y problem, given the last example I gave. The way we do this is we use a thing called a label generic. So just as generic will give you this data structure representing the types of all the fields in your uh, case class. Label generic will tell you, here are all the types, and here are all the names of the fields. How long have I got, by the way? Is it number, number 15? Brilliant. OK, loads of time. Here are all the names of the fields. So you see this, this field type thing is kind of crazy, right? It's, it's, a it's a type, but it has a symbol in it, which is a bit weird. So what that is, um, that obviously the symbol is telling us what the name of the field is, but it is actually a type. It's a thing called a literal type. Who's heard of literal types before? So there's a few people and a lot of people who haven't. That's fair enough, right? This is a fairly new thing. These are things that have existed, or singleton types and literal types have sort of existed in the Scala compiler, but we haven't been able to write them until very, very recently. So they're sort of an underlying mechanism, but now we can actually write them in code with like Scala 2.11.9, and I forget all the num numbers, um, but, but recent versions of the Scala compiler. Um, so if you see, see uh, you can take a, the symbol name and you can put it in a variable of type symbol. That's fine. You can also put it in a variable of type name. So name there is the type of that particular symbol. It's a subtype of symbol. We don't normally use these types because they're not very useful. As soon as we change the symbol or we take that number 42 and we add one to it, it's no longer of type 42. It becomes an int. So they're normally not that useful, but in this, type, this case, they're really useful because we can key off of these types when we're searching for implicits. So we can search for, not just an implicit for a string, we can search, search for an implicit for a string and look up what the name is and then resolve, and resolve some code, turn the name into a, a value, a runtime value. So um, 
what, the way we express our rules, if we're going to do it with shapeless, is we actually, rather than use accessor methods, we write just simple literals in our code, and we use a thing called, from shapeless called a witness, which will calculate what the type of that simple literal would be. Uh, and uh, this is the code. I don't just blur your eyes. Don't look at it in detail. But um, uh, we can see somewhere at the top there's the word witness, and that is the thing where it's going. It's going. There's an implicit conversion there. We write a symbol, and then Shapeless calculates what the singleton type for that would be, what the literal type of that for, from that would be, and then we start using that in all our recursive search for implicits. So back to 40 lines of code again. It's funny these two examples. They have the same lines of code in opposite orders. Back to 40 lines of code again. So it is, it is possible to do this in Shapeless. Uh, I think the solution, though, has a much cleaner implementation as a macro. Uh, and that's, that's because of the nature of the problem. So this is the first thing you should think about when trying, to, when trying to solve a problem with metaprogramming, is what type of problem are you trying to solve? OK, I'm very nearly wrapping up. So take homes. This is the deep take home point. Macro is good for syntactic stuff. Shapeless good for sort of structural or like type-based, uh, inferring types from other types, inferring solutions from other types kind of stuff. So that's your first choice point. The other thing, though, the really key take-home point here is that in both cases, most of the solution that we've been dealing with, most of the code that we're dealing with is about designing a library first. So make some algebraic data types, do some structural recursion, make some type classes, all of these good pra functional practices. That solves your problem. This is just a thin layer on top. Um, so, <laughs> so this is what I have been calling the quotable slide. Metaprogramming is kind of, for at least for these use cases, is a convenience. Right? We solve the problem first, and then we make life easier for the developer on top of that. And I don't know if I don't know if I'm comfortable enough to say that that is the, the, the way you should think about it for all problems ever, but it's certainly the way that I think about it for problems where I try to use this stuff in my code. So uh, we have a couple of minutes. I want to just point you to some useful topics, uh, useful further reading. Uh, on the macro side, uh, I've fixed your name now. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I wrote Toma's name as Toma Wicks. Uh, shout out to Wix, who employ Toma. <laughs> um, uh, I did a talk about macros. Uh, Toma did specifically talk about using macros for validation, which is great, really on topic for this. Uh, they're both great. Also, Chris Birchall's uh, metaprogramming talk, uh, he gave this at uh, Scala Matsuri. The, this is actually a London Scala user group video. It has a slightly higher resolution slide set on it. Uh, it's uh, all good. good. Good resources for learning about macros. Shapeless. Uh, you can get a copy of my book. If you want one and you don't have one, you can grab them from the front afterwards. Um, there's the talk version of the book is that middle link. That's a 20-minute talk where we go through a type class in detail from beginning to end. And then if you want to hear somebody who really uh, uses Shapeless in real libraries that real people use, as opposed to my toy libraries, uh, Sam Halliday's workshop um, from Scarlet Exchange a couple of years ago is, is really great. Um, but I've said that like most of this, most of this the stuff I've been talking about is like just just write nice clean functional code. What is clean functional code? Uh, if you're interested, if you're sort of fairly new to functional programming and you you sort of want to know uh, 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 what people keep talking about in in terms of what is clean pure functional code, uh, these are like the least complicated introductory talks I could point you to. So my colleague Noel um, goes through. The sort of the main principles that we use in our training courses, which are also one of the books that we've uh, uh, now open sourced. And then this, if you want to see the evolution of checklist from just an idea through to the library, I've given a couple of talks about that. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm required to say please rate all sessions on the Scala Days app. Um, but yes, no, thank you. And does anyone have any questions? There? Cheers. Oh, thank you. So um, about the letter uh, example that you provided, um, what has better compile times, the shapeless solution or the macro solution? What has better ty compile times? For the examples we so, well, examples I've given, for the second example, uh, the macro is faster. It's a very, very simple problem for a macro to solve. For the first example, um, it depends on how you do things. So the thing that's slow is not shapeless. Well, the thing that's slow is implicit resolution, right? 
finding implicits. So when you're using implicits, you, you, implicits solving things with implicits is a search problem. And uh, the complexity of the problem depends on the complexity of the search space. So if you sort of provide the biggest data structure in the world and ask Shapeless to divide it into all its constituent parts and solve something with implicits, then that could be very, very slow. And I'm talking, you know, maybe you have a hundred field or a couple of hundred fields in your algebraic data type and your sealed traits and your case classes. So that's a tricky problem to solve. And the, as again, the, the, the way to solve it is don't deal with the whole thing in one go. Uh, break it down. If, you're, if you have a, something with a couple of hundred fields in it, the likelihood is you have intermediate types, you solve for those types. So I'm dodging the question slightly, but the, the answer is it depends on how your macros are implemented, and it depends on how your shapeless code is implemented. And there are, if you think about the search space that you're creating with implicits, that's the way to get around this kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Can I make a small follow-up question, maybe? Then, sure. Um, <laughs> yep. So um, uh, regarding the, f the future, um, what do you think will get uh, better performance um, improvements, uh, macros or like implicit resolution? Uh, well, um, I think maybe I'll duck that question and pass it to uh, the man with the beard. <laughs> so, the, so the answer to that question is that the work that I've been doing on inductive implicits that um, Dave mentioned in his talk um, is, uh, I think, I think the uh, the right solution to this problem. Um, what it, the way it works is it, it looks for the kind of inductive patterns that that, that Dave illustrated very very nicely in, in his example. Uh, and uh, if you like, solves it directly, rather than using the fully general implicit search mechanism that's, that, that's used uh, to cover all cases, it, it, it has a, um, a, a particular solution strategy for inductions, which um, would have the same compile time performance as if you were to code it up by hand as a macro, essentially. There you go. And that's what's the sort of the what's the the thing that I messed up on that Miles? Sorry, um, can keep the mic with Miles for a sec. Uh, what's the where are we with that? And what's the what can people expect in terms of? So it's a pull request against um, Scala 211 and 212. Um, it's not merged yet. Uh, I, 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 I hope to badger Adrian at some point over the next day or two uh, about that. And um, there is one missing piece. Uh, which means that uh, it's not uh, at the moment a, 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 a completely seamless solution, um, which is which is the, the use of lazy, which you didn't you, you, you appeared in your slides, but it didn't yeah. uh, didn't mention it. So lazy, lazy is an important uh, feature of this because it's one of the things which allows um, uh, implicit resolutions, which um, technically speaking should diverge as far as the Scala compiler to converge in these kinds of inductive cases where we know that that's the right thing to do. Um, that uses this bit of magic machinery and shape is called lazy. Uh, I am in the process of translating that into um, uh, an interpretation of what by name implicit arguments would be in Scala. Uh, that's actually something that, 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 that Martin picked up uh, and has already uh, implemented in, he's, he's beaten me to it in terms of implementing <laughs> it in Dotty. Uh, he's also done me a big favor of actually writing a SIP for it, so I don't, I don't have to do that, which is nice. So to get the full benefits of uh, what I've been promising in terms of indu in, inductive implicit heuristics, it needs both the stuff that I've already done plus this. But that's, that's pretty straightforward, and I, I'm expecting to have that in the next, in the next type level Scala release quite soon. Okay. So, yeah. Watch a, a type level Scala near you. Any other questions for anyone? Yeah, we've got one here on the right. Uh, did you have your hand up on the front, or does anyone have? I, I can't really see very well. <laughs> uh, hi. Hey. So you skipped a part of your presentation, and I saw it mentioned MacWire, so I was wondering what you were going to say about that. So that's very simple. Um, so MacWire, uh, has anyone used MacWire here? Yeah, loads of people. Cool, cool. Right, OK. Uh, so MacWire is a dependency injection library, and it's, let's just tell you what. Let's do uh, MacWire, 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 MacWire. Wait for it, wait for it. Error messages, compile times, MacWire. So MacWire, yeah, is a dependency injection library that's implemented using macros. So if you have some database and some web routing and you have a service which needs the database and the web routing, rather than write that by hand, you can use Okay, all right, I want to stay on this slide, please. You can use this wire macro. So you can see like, that wire macro expands 
into this larger call. Now, the wire macro is a macro. It's implemented using macros. It looks like a really simple macro to write, right? But the key thing is it's doing sort of uh, the equivalent of implicit resolution. So it's looking at the parameters to service there and seeing what types are these, what definitions do I have in scope that are of the right types. And, so, and it's not using implicits, and that's specifically it's a design goal of MacWire. So it, ha it handles implicits through one system, or it's using implicit resolution for one thing. It wants to deal with things that are not implicits. So there is a li library in MacWire which is just about traversing scopes and finding these things. And it's a non-trivial problem. It's a very difficult problem. 350 lines of code, way longer than anything that I've shown, and presumably took a long time to get right. And the, the point there is merely that if you find yourself doing things like this, you're using the wrong approach, right? You can rely on built-in mechanisms of Scala to do a lot of the heavy lifting, so you don't have to write it in your meta programming. That was, that was all it was. I, I thought it was quite interesting uh, when I found out, when I was sort of browsing the source code, I found, okay, I thought this was really easy, but actually it's quite hard, and it's pretty impressive what they've done. Any more? So, um, <laughs> uh, hey. so, so the, the second example you had, um, you were using label generic. Uh, yes. As far as I know, that's also implemented with macros underneath. There are, um, yes, there are some small macros at the core of, of, of Shapeless. Yes. So you need a macro to get hold of the field names. Mm -hmm. so, so you're essentially replacing a macro implementation with a library that uses macros. I, right? have, I have a question for you. What is the best type of macro? One, One you don't have to write. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, yes, exactly. There are there are these things, but they're, you know, the, the problem with this code is not using the macro. The problem is having to maintain the macro. So uh, having one centrally maintained macro, small centrally maintained. Maintain macro, and it also not only means that you get out of having to maintain it. There are all sorts of. I've had macros that I thought would work really well, where when somebody, rather than using a val, uses a lazy val, it crashes the compiler. So there's some, you know, I mean, we're talking about Scala Reflect here, and this is why Scala Meta is coming along. We can get a better abstraction from the compiler, and it's safer and easier to reason about. But uh, there are, there will be situations with macros that you haven't thought about, basically. Um, Thank you. Okay, cool. All right, well, look, um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll go to break. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>